All right, I'm Mike Hartman, uh, a co-editor of The Giving View uh, Review, along with fellow co-editor Dan Schmidt, my longtime mentor at the Bradley Foundation in Milwaukee, uh, and our guest today, Michael Lind. Uh, we're very happy you're able to join us, uh, Michael, and we totally uh, appreciate it. Uh, Michael Lind is someone whose work we've tracked closely for quite some time. Uh, there's going to be biographical material uh, about you, Michael, in the uh, article of which this video will be a part. So uh, I won't just repeat all that here, uh, but please know we're not short shrifting you. Uh, he's currently a professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at uh, UT Austin. He has written several books, contributes widely to the public discourse in, in, in journals and newspapers. Uh, his work has generally covered uh, democratic nationalism, including uh, what should be the proper understanding of it uh, and, and the challenges to it. Uh, his most recent book is, we have props here, The New Class War, uh, the subtitle of which is Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite. It, it caught our eye and we've excerpted really part of it uh, in the Giving Review. An important recent article that Michael uh, has written uh, for, the, for the tablet or tablet outlines what he calls the COVID class war, uh, which also caught our eye and which we noted at the Giving Review. So let's just get started uh, here. Uh, Michael, what is the new class war, as you call it, uh, and where is philanthropy in it? Now, when I build on uh, the ex Trotskyist conservative James Burnham's notion from the 1940s of the managerial revolution, uh, which is the idea that uh, 19th century small business owner capitalism uh, was already giving way by the 1920s and 1930s to what he called the managerial society. And, and that's and he defined managerial very broadly to define the managers and, and also professionals as uh, not like just being in, in the private sector like CEOs and middle managers, but also being uh, high ranking government officials, uh, military officers, uh, officialdom in general. Uh, and that includes uh, members of, uh, of philanthropies and, and of uh, charities foundations and think tanks. Uh, and his argument in the 40s was that New Deal America, fascist uh, Italy, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union under Stalin were emerging managerial societies. That is uh, the key to power in all these otherwise quite different societies was that you held office in a powerful bureaucracy, which could be a company, it could be a uh, 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 philanthropy, it could be a, uh, a government uh, agency, uh, as opposed to being the independently wealthy, you know, owner operator of, of an entire business, you know, like 19th century capitalists like Rockefeller or, or uh, uh, you know, Andrew uh, Carnegie. Uh, so to, to that extent, he came out of the Marxist tradition and he kept the notion of the proletariat, that is this wage earning class, so now the overwhelming majority in all industrial societies, uh, people, uh, proletarian comes from the Latin word uh, for those who owned no property. Uh, that is, they lived by wages, you know, hand to mouth, and they didn't have uh, uh, independent um, asset uh, income. Uh, so, so, uh, so in a sense, you can see, argue that Marx was right about the proletarianization of what had been peasants, the peasant majority becoming a working class majority. He was wrong about the new ruling class. It's actually uh, people in big public, private, nonprofit bureaucracies, and particularly now in, in the industrial democracies, access is not through birth or connections, it's through uh, diplomas, it's through credentials. Uh, so I, I speak of uh, what is called the, what I call the overclass to distinguish it from the traditional upper class, which makes you think of polo ponies and debutante balls and Downton Abbey. The overclass is much more broad and includes, uh, at the broadest, you can include all people with bachelor's degrees, but uh, which is about 35% uh, of the population in the US. Uh, so it's about a third of the population, top third. In practice, you need a master's degree or a professional degree or some sort of terminal degree, PhD, to, to really ascend to the highest levels of public, private, nonprofit bureaucracies in 21st century America for the most part. Uh, and uh, for that reason, you could say, you know, this stratum, the upper class, is really no more than 10 or 15 percent 
of the population. So when you, in your 96 book, Up From Conservatism, uh, had a little bit of a critique of the neoconservative description of uh, the new class, uh, did you change your mind about uh, uh, How does one reconcile your critique of that and the current, uh, well, your current book about the new class war? Is, is it in that overclass, upper class distinction? Well, it, it actually has to do with the uh, the private versus uh, public and nonprofit. So, and I was a young neoconservative, uh, second wave, second generation neoconservative uh, in, the, in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and I criticized uh, a lot of the neoconservative intellectuals for using new class to mean adversary culture, which was a very useful concept. It existed in the 80s and 90s, it exists now. It's, dominates uh, campus, although it's no longer the adversaries, they've taken over the country. So it's now the dominant culture. At that time, uh, the radical left was this adversary uh, minority. Uh, and many of the neoconservatives, including my then employer, Irving Kristol, used it to mean uh, left-wing academics and uh, nonprofits and activists and so on. And my argument was that, well, no, they're, they're part of the same elite socially, they have the same families, same schools as the for-profit lawyers and doctors and middle managers for the most part, not small business owners who are a distinct stratum, but the managers. Uh, and years later, about 20 years after I made that critique in my book, The Next American Nation in 1996, I discovered that James Burnham in the early 1970s had published an article in National Review uh, criticizing the same use of the new class. And he said, well, come on, you know, you guys don't really, and these fight his allies on the right, but he says, let's face it, you know, the CEO of General Motors and Ford and, you know, the Rockefeller banking interests and so on, uh, you know, that they are, you know, part of the elite. You can't just say there's, uh, and socially, they tend to be part of the same elite. Christopher Lash, who's received a lot of, of justly deserved tradition, now, uh, attention now, several decades after his death, uh, all through his work, he shows that the, the bohemian countercultural left tends to be the trust fund children of the great managers and uh, capitalists. And that's true now uh, with hipsters in Brooklyn. It was true with Greenwich Village in the early 20, 20th century. So I think if you're talking about class, then partisanship doesn't work that much. You have to look at social origins, education, uh, criteria like that. Michael, I was going to ask you a follow-up question to that, to that commentary you just offered. And, and with respect to conservative philanthropy, you mentioned your, your early days, if you want to call them those, uh, with Irving Kristol uh, and Irving, of course, uh, as a neoconservative moving from the left uh, to center, center-right, uh, took advantage of uh, foundations, not many of them on the conservative side. There were a few major ones and, of course, individuals. But uh, the, the drive was on in the early 80s, as you recall, I'm sure, for conservative foundations to help build the conservative infrastructure uh, to challenge, if you will, on the field with, with the, of jousting with the, the radical left. In light of your comments you've just made, was uh, just looking back on it, not to say right or wrong mm -hmm. those times, but uh, was there an adequate uh, analysis and understanding on the part of those donors with respect to uh, first what the situation was then and how the possibilities of it evolving if there were sort of different cuts at that analysis with respect to the kinds of investments they made in building the conservative map of infrastructure? Well, I, I think uh, in the early years, uh, they, they played a, a terrific role in promoting uh, intellectual discourse and debate in the US, second only to the Central Intelligence Agency. And I say that because the CIA funded Encounter, one of the great intellectual magazines of the 20th, uh, 20th century. And there, there's a big scandal when this was exposed. Uh, Irving Kristol, along with Stephen Spender, had been a uh, co-editor of Encounter. And my view always was, this is a great magazine. I wish the CIA funded more, <laughs> more things. Uh, uh, but so these fairly small uh, foundations, like the Bradley Foundation, they, they were dwarfed by the size of Ford and Rockefeller and these huge, you know, uh, liberal foundations, uh, you know, just with the funding, the national interest commentary, uh, uh, 
the, the uh, public interest, uh, some of these other journals, the new criterion, you know, they, they really uh, uh, provide an alternative to the center left conventional wisdom of that day. Now I broke with uh, a lot of my colleagues over Pat Robertson uh, in the mid nineties uh, when he announced that Lucifer controlled the council on foreign relations and uh, 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 the uh, international bankers were behind the Gulf War. And so, uh, but my, my basic criticism of the neoconservative movement in the second half of the 90s uh, was that it became too closely aligned with the Republican Party. Uh, and I think this is actually killing the progressive movement right now. Uh, you know, I, I remember uh, in 1992, I went on a skiing vacation with William F. Buckley Jr. in Switzerland with his best friend. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, and politics just never came up. I mean, there was an intellectual world, right? Uh, and, you know, the, the, when, when your in, intellectuals get too close to uh, party operatives, uh, then they can't think about what kind of society do we want to live in in the next 30 years. You have to think about, are, are we on message uh, later, I, I've never really fit in anywhere, center right or, or center left. Uh, I, I uh, had a column for Salon for a time, which was a center left publication. And the editor asked me in the Obama years, well, you get the talking points from the White House every morning like the rest of us, don't you? Yeah. And I said, no, <laughs> I didn't realize that. Uh, but, but that's the problem. You know, when conservative becomes equated with Republican, and progressive with democratic, then essentially you're getting the DNC, the RNC, whatever the group is, they're, they're emailing people talking points every morning. And, and that's why you know, this great light bulb went off over my head. But that's why on these talking head shows, they all say the same things hour after hour. They got that even down to particular statistics. That was the talking points. So, uh, so, my, you know, my general view of philanthropy is the longer the leash, uh, particularly when, when you have intellectuals, the better. Uh, one, of, one of the problems is that there's less and less general support of the kind that the Bradley Foundation gave very generously, you know, to uh, the neoconservative publications and think tanks and institutes. Increasingly, it's a very short leash, you know, it's one year grants, maybe less than that. Yeah. Why don't we uh, finish part one there and pick up with uh, part two next?